I'm uh, I'm in uh, in Wise, Virginia. Today is the 12th of November, 2018, and I'm recording a, a video of uh, my talk uh, five years ago uh, of the uh, about the Royal Proclamation of 1763. So on the next slide, we see the um, the actual original presentation. So this I gave in in uh, in Blacksburg, actually in town council chambers. Uh, in honor of the 250th anniversary of the Proclamation of 1763, and I subtitled it, since I was in Blacksburg, I subtitled it the uh, Blacksburg Connection. But uh, now, five years later, I understand a little more about it, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, Christiansburg and uh, Montgomery County. The uh, Proclamation was a document issued by King George III in an attempt to um, govern and provide a management structure for North America after the English won it uh, at the end of the French and Indian War. And that's what I'm going to detail in this um, production. And I thank, down the bottom in blue, I thank the, uh, thank the um, Blacksburg Museum and Cultural Foundation for the invitation to do this talk. So the talk really carries, carries us from 18th century London. There's an image from uh, Wikipedia of uh, London in the 18th century. I grew up in London, so I remember St. Paul's, but St. Paul's wasn't as prominent when I grew up in London. There were a lot of other tall buildings. And uh, the picture at the bottom is a picture I took uh, near the uh, golf course in Blacksburg, right from the proclamation line. So we're looking down into uh, Virginia Tech, onto the Virginia Tech campus from the golf course in uh, Blacksburg, right on the proclamation line. And it was in 1763 that George III drew a line, uh, which in time, led to what was a direct provocation for the Virginians to the American Revolution. So here are the themes that I talked about uh, in that talk. First of all is the European struggle for North America. And uh, I pan out frequently to, uh, to my Virginian friends that uh, there was no guarantee that we had to speak English here in Virginia. Uh, the French and Indian War could have gone to the French and there were lots of, earlier there were lots of uh, Spanish Germans in that Virginia begins as a uh, Spanish colony, and uh, it was only as a result of a uh, lucky result of war that uh, eventually North America winds up being English. We talk about the British success and how they used it or how they misused it to provoke the American Revolution. We we'll talk very much about the Virginians' drive for Western land, which is a topic I've written about a lot over the years. I'll describe the geography of the proclamation line uh, in general in America, and then in Virginia, and finally in Blacksburg. And I also mentioned today a little bit about the proclamation line in Christiansburg, and I'll talk about it as a provocation for the American Revolution. So here's a map from uh, Austin uh, in the 19, 1903 book uh, that uh, shows, I've colored it up, shows the uh, European land claims in North America in 1750. And you can see it at the, at the bottom in South and Central America it's uh, principally Spanish with a, a little bit in Belize, a little bit of an English claim there in the uh, Yucatan, and, uh, and the Spanish, of course, claim Florida. The French claim all of uh, the center of America. The French very early figured out that you could get from the uh, St. Lawrence River, make a short overland trip, and then go down the uh, Mississippi River. So the French have got uh, the central part of uh, America. And today, that we recognize that with the names of the places such as St. Louis. Why is St. Louis on the Missouri uh, so, so named? Because it was originally French territory. And then the British have uh, lots of fur trapping uh, properties around Hudson Bay. And then the 13 original colonists, which cling to the, uh, to the east coast of North America. So there's a, 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 common, uh, a um, competition amongst a lot of um, European powers uh, for North America in 1750. The French and Indian War, which is a war which lasts from approximately 1754 to 1760, is called the Seven Years' War in Britain, and Winston Churchill called it the First World War. I was challenged when I wrote an article, put that in there to, to provide that quote, and the First World War is actually the chapter, a title chapter, of one of Winston Churchill's many history books. And the uh, Seven Years' War is the subject of many books, including The Crucible of War, which was written by the historian Fred Anderson and which has an accompanying video. So on the left you see um, Fred Anderson's um, 2001 book, The Seven Years' War, which is 
uh, if not the dominant book, certainly one, one of the most important books about the uh, Seven Years' War. And on the right, you see, highly recommended by me, you see the home video which uh, covers that. So it, the, the, the book covers uh, all of the Seven Year uh, War. And on the cover of the book, you see General James Wolfe, who, who was killed at the Battle of uh, Quebec. And on the cover of the video, it shows a, a, a Native American with the young uh, George Washington. So, the French and Indian War was part of a worldwide clash, a world war clash between the French, primarily the French and the English. And the French and English engaged in an epic struggle for war power and global commercial control. And in, in North America, it's dated from roughly, it's called the French and Indian War, and it's dated from roughly 1754 to 1760. And during the war years, a European and American Indian conflict was intense along the Indian frontier. It was a very nasty time along the uh, Virginia frontier. A couple more books about the, uh, the French and Indian War and about the, the Seven Years' War in general. Uh, on the left you see Clash of Empires by Scott Stevenson. This is also a very readable book. And at the right you see William Fowler's uh, book, Empires at War. There are many, many, many more books. This is a very well-known period of um, Virginia history and much has been written about it. This quote, the First World War, as Churchill quoted, it, began at Fort Necessity, uh, a few miles to the east of Pittsburgh, near Pittsburgh, on July, 3rd of July, 1754. Uh, George Washington was sent west by Governor Dinwiddie to expel the French from, quote, quote, the Virginia Territory, which was uh, uh, there in, in what is uh, now uh, modern-day Pennsylvania and the Ohio country. And uh, on the left is my picture. I, was there on a, on a lonely day a few years ago, one cold February. That's Fort Necessity. You can see in the distance behind the, um, the visitor's interpretive plaque. And on the, on the right uh, is a, a picture from the visitor center there showing the British Army. But I don't think the British Army looked anything like that good on, uh, on that day. They were probably a lot more ragged than shown there. 1755 in, in July, is a, uh, was a terrible disaster from the British point of view. Uh, the English thought that they could simply send an army into the Ohio country, into the Ohio Territory, and expel the French. And so Braddock took a long time building a road from Alexander, Virginia, to Pittsburgh. And he made a huge, long, overland haul with heavy equipment. And when they eventually arrived near Pittsburgh, he was unfamiliar with forest warfare, and he got into a disastrous fight with the Indian allies of the French, and he was actually killed there. George Washington was there. He was a, George Washington was serving as an aide to Braddock. And so when that happened, it left uh, southwest Virginia and the frontier uh, completely exposed to, uh, to Indian attack, and uh, it was a really disastrous beginning for the French and Indian War uh, for, uh, for England. One of the very early events of the, of the French and Indian War was the so-called Draper's Meadow Massacre, which happened in Blacksburg, and in, in, in obviously in the future Blacksburg. And Colonel James Patton was killed by probably Shawnee Indians in 1755. And the picture shows the Daughters of the American Revolution marker, which is beside Plantation Road near the Virginia Deck, uh, Duck Pond on the way to the uh, Smithville Plantation. Now, one of the records we have of how bad that period of time was on the frontier was a record made by William Preston, uh, and it's called uh, William Preston's Register. It was originally published by Waddell in the uh, Virginia Magazine of History and Biography back in 1895. And it's basically a list of the persons who were either killed or wounded or taken prisoners by the enemy in Augusta County. And at that time, uh, Augusta County was all of the Virginia frontier, the gigantic Augusta County. I'll show you that in a few minutes. And between 1754 and uh, in October and May 1758, Preston's Register, which is probably in his handwriting, lists the names of 308 people killed in 30 separate frontier settlement attacks. So it's a nasty period of time on the Virginia frontier. In, 19, in 1759, we have what the, what the British call Annus Mirabilis, the Year of Miracles because uh, the, the English had great success, finally, after a, a long period of time and the expenditure of much money. The English Prime Minister, 
Horace Walpole said, our bells are one threadbare with ringing for victories. Among those victories were the conquering of Quebec, the seizing of the Indian country finally, the uh, repulse of the French siege of Madras in India, and the Allied victory at the Battle of Minden, and the Royal Navy won two important battles uh, that year off uh, the coast of, uh, uh, coast of Portugal at Lagos and at Cuberon Bay in Brittany. It was really, a, truly a, a year of miracles for the British, and that led uh, ultimately to the suing for peace and uh, to the so-called 1763 Treaty of Paris, which is in many ways where the story of America begins. And in, the, in Paris in 1763, the French gave up all the territory of mainland North America. Spain kept Cuba in exchange for giving Florida to Great Britain. That's eventually how Florida becomes American. And the French territories to the west of Mississippi and New Orleans became, uh, and New Orleans became Spanish. This was all done with the scratch of a pen. There were lots of books about this. This is one I like in particular. This is Colin Calloway's 2000 book called The Scratch of the Pen. And with the scratch of a pen, America becomes transformed. The Treaty of Paris uh, did that. So here, are, uh, to recall, here are the land claims in 1750, the slide I showed you just a few minutes ago. And then just 13 years later, it's only 13 years later, this happens. It's the, arguably the largest transfer of land at the end of any war in history, when all of the French territory in North America becomes British. The only part that the French remained was they had uh, rights to a couple of small islands at the mouth of St. Lawrence so that they could dry their codfish uh, there. And those, those two, two islands still remain under French control to this day, which is not a, a fact which is well known. But in any event, North America is transformed in 1763. So, as a role of this, the British have to figure out how are they going to handle North America. They've got this enormous territory, which obviously is far too, far too big to govern militarily, and how are they going to uh, control it? And so the, the uh, British Ministry uh, works on developing a management plan, which is sent to the King, and King George III eventually signed it. So here's his picture, painted uh, in 1762, which is the year before he signed the uh, proclamation, and on the right is his coat of arms is uh, taken, just taken from uh, Wikipedia. The, the note, uh, he ruled, he's a long ruling king, he rose for 60 years. <clears throat> so here is the 1763 proclamation on the left. This is uh, 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 just a picture of the, of the original uh, handwritten version, and by the king, a proclamation, whereas we have taken into our royal consideration the extensive and valuable acquisitions in America secured to our crown by the late definitive Treaty of Paris concluded in February. And it's signed by George R. And George R. stands for George Rex. In modern terms, Queen Elizabeth is, is always uh, counted as Ear Elizabeth Rex. So and there's on the left is George III's official royal signature. Here's the proclamation printed in the uh, London Gazette the day after its uh, promulgation. So there's a full, uh, full copy, and you can find lots of copies if you just check online for the 1763 proclamation. You can find lots of them. The objectives of this were primarily to establish administrative regions in North America by which the, the um, British could organize and control its newly acquired half a billion acres of territory to the north and west and south of the original 13 colonies. And essentially, as I said, the proclamation was a management plan for the newly acquired British North American Empire. So after the 17, 1763 proclamation, here's what the, the map looked like. The two green regions to the north and the south were ceded by France to, to England, and uh, the original 13 colonies remained, and to the west of the original 13 colonies, the English established an Indian reserve to which the Virginians were forbidden from emigrating and uh, taking up uh, land. So <clears throat> the provisions barring Western land claims read as follows. And whereas the several nations or tribes of Indians with whom we are connected and who live under our protection should not be molested or disturbed, parts of our dominions and territories are reserved to them. That's the, uh, the orange region here. That's what the uh, proclamation says 
but that is reserved to the Indians. And no governor or commander in chief of any of our colonies, no governor, uh, colonial governor, shall grant warrants of survey or pass patents of any land. That's no surveying allowed and no granting of land beyond the heads or sources of any of the rivers which fall into the Atlantic Ocean from the north, from the west, and the northwest. So the above language in red defines the eastern continental divide of America as the proclamation line. The 1763 proclamation also made provision for soldiers' land claims. In general, when Americans fought for the British in, in North America, the British did not pay them. It was would have been very expensive. But what they did instead was to award land grants to Americans, and that in effect served as payment. This becomes very important in the run-up to the American Revolution. So, quote, we do hereby command and empower our governors to grant, that's the veterans of the French and Indian War, the following quantities of land. Field officers got 5,000 acres, captains got 3,000 acres, subalterns or staff officers got 2,000 acres, every non-commissioned officer got 200 acres, and every private man was 50 acres. America was land rich, but money poor. The British eventually in 1774 renounced these uh, uh, claims, uh, but it was already too late. The, the uh, American Revolution was already well set by 1774. It was inevitable. So uh, now some words about American westward land. The Virginians spent a lot of time in tidewater. The Virginians took a long time for the Virginians to figure out that they had a continent at their back door. Uh, William uh, Beverly, finally, uh, of Beverly Manor, who, who lived at Tappahannock on the Rappahannock River, finally ob obtained, quote, the Beverly Manor grant in September of 1736. And in 1738, Augusta County was created by legislation in by, by and it held its first court in 1745. Augusta, I'll show you the map in a minute, goes all the way to the Mississippi River and all the way to the Great Lakes. So when Augusta County is created, the Virginians have finally figured out that they've got a, got a continent to, to use. And the principal business in Augusta County was the surveying and the patenting of Western land, primarily for the, for the Eastern Virginia elite. James Patton, William Preston, and others spearheaded Virginia's Western expansion. And that's why Patton and Preston, who was his nephew, are so important in the story of the expansion of Virginia. So here on this map, I show what happens with uh, the uh, creation of Augusta County. The purple region on the right is how Virginia was in 1737. And when Augusta County was created by the General Assembly, you can see how huge it is. It increased 10 or 11 fold. And some historians, uh, the language says it goes to the, the farthest extent of Virginia. Some historians even say that you would extend Virginia all the way to the uh, Pacific Ocean. But most historians stop at the, um, at the Mississippi River. There are many uh, uh, now, uh, 11 or 12 US states which are covered by this. Following the creation of Augusta County, <coughs> the Virginia colonists engaged in an absolute orgy of Western land uh, uh, speculation. So, so from 1738 uh, up until 1763, there were just enormous amounts of land taken up by all kinds of um, primarily wealthy Eastern Virginians. And the proclamation line, when it was declared, stopped cold the colonist land speculation. And this activity, the, uh, the Western activity, in inevitably led to competition with the, with the French. And this is uh, perhaps one of the principal reasons for the French and Indian War, is the competition for land, particularly in the, in the Ohio country. So having given you the general picture of uh, the historical reasons for the, the proclamation line, let's talk about the now, in the next few slides, let's talk about the uh, geography of the Eastern Continental Divide, which is e equally well called the Proclamation Line. Here is the whole of the Eastern Continental Divide, the land to the left, to the west, 
which the water flows eventually to the Gulf of Mexico, to the Mississippi, and to the right of the red line, it flows to a whole bunch of rivers which flow into the Atlantic Ocean. And it's defined then as the, the line where the, the waters separate from those that flow to the Atlantic, from those that flow to the Mississippi and to the Gulf. Here in Virginia is the Eastern Continental Divide, and you see it very neatly divides, de, divides the western, southwestern part of Virginia from, uh, from the eastern part of Virginia. So this is uh, derived, this is a map I made, derived just from the uh, U.S. national map. So that's the proclamation line in Virginia. And today it's ironic that I'm here talking in uh, Wise County about this, which is shown in red on the left, and pr primarily today my talk is going to be at Montgomery County, which is right, as you can see now, having seen the previous map, which is right on the proclamation line. And so I'm going to be talking about how the proclamation line goes through Montgomery County. Here's Montgomery County. On the left, just shown in yellow on a map. Principally know many people know it, because Interstate 81 divides Montgomery County north and south. In contrast, the Eastern Continental Divide, shown in the map on the right, the Eastern Continental Divide divides Montgomery County east and west. So they're really quite orthogonal. And you can see clearly, I just I marked that up by putting on the rivers. Uh, I used a, an ArcGIS map, and I uh, got the Montgomery County rivers and simply separated from those that flow to the Continental Divide, from those that uh, flow to the east, to those that, uh, from those that flow to the west on the Continental Divide. And so you can see that Montgomery County is very nicely divided in two twice. It's divided north-south by Interstate 81, and it's divided east-west by the proclamation line of the Eastern Continental Divide. I don't have such good information on, on Montgomery County as a whole. This is a map I obtained quite, quite uh, recently, but it's a map of the um, watersheds in um, Montgomery County. And a detailed analysis of this map, picking out which way each of the watersheds flows, would in fact generate the same map. In other words, if I go back a couple, the map shown on the right here, I can use this map now to generate the one shown on the right there in considerable detail because I've got the actual watersheds themselves. Here is the Eastern Continental Divide in the town of Blacksburg. And the divide runs, it runs east of Main Street on the north side of town, and it crosses Main Street near Airport Road. I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. And it runs west of Main Street on the south side of town. And I made this map actually on the, uh, uh, got this map on the uh, 250th anniversary to the day. It was made by uh, Miss Catherine Smith, who was the town of Blacksburg GIS coordinator, of whom I thank uh, the map. So that's the Eastern Continental Divide in Blacksburg. And here it is in downtown Blacksburg. Uh, the red area on the left, many of you will be familiar with, that's the Virginia Tech drill field. And just a little bit to the south of that is the uh, Virginia Tech football stadium. And uh, the red square at the lower center is the Blacksburg Town Hall, which was where I actually originally presented this talk. And uh, Main Street Blacksburg uh, is running uh, left to right down the, the uh, center of the um, map. And the red squares show the actual continental divide, which is on the west side of Blacksburg. This is uh, just recently uh, the, the town of Blacksburg and the Blacksburg Museum and Cultural Center have actually marked up the uh, on Main Street, the um, proclamation line. And you see there, they put up a big blue plastic strip. This is not far from where I live. And this was laid down maybe in April of this year. You can see that the dogwood trees are in bloom at the back of the picture. And on the left is a, a brief text which I drafted back at the, at the time that the uh, marker was originally put up. Now in Christiansburg, we have a similar situation. And this is uh, more recently, uh, I've started to think about the Christiansburg watersheds. And on this map, the easy thing, this is a, a, a map produced by the town of Christiansburg uh, by the engineering department, which they have online. So it was very convenient to have this online. And what this shows is very easy to describe in words. The red watershed at the top, which I think is uh, Slate Creek, and the uh, Crab Creek water, uh, watershed are green. The red and the green watersheds are on the western side. Those waters flow to the Mississippi River. Whereas all of the blue areas 
go to the forks of the Roanoke River, and they ultimately flow to the, to, to the Roanoke River, which ultimately flows through North Carolina and to Albemarle Sound. And if you look closely, you can see the distinguishing features of Christiansburg is Interstate 81, which runs through Christiansburg. So, anywhere on this map where a blue area meets a green or a red area, anywhere on this map where a blue area meets a green or red area, that is by definition a crossing of the Eastern Continental Divide. So probably the two busiest crossings of the Eastern Continental Divide, unknown to drivers who travel up and down Interstate 81, is that both Christiansburg exits, you are on one exit at the, coming up to the top of Christiansburg Mountain, you cross for the first time into the Western Continental Divide, and then at the, at the interstate exit for the town of Christiansburg, the second uh, interstate exit, it's a very brief period where you go back into the um, into the, to the east of the Eastern Continental Divide and then back to the uh, western area. And that's near the, um, uh, that crossing is near the Route 8 Donut Shop, for those of you who know Christiansburg, that's close to the Route 8 Donut Shop. I wrote a column back in October uh, crossing the uh, title, crossing the Eastern Continental Divide in Christiansburg, in which I basically made the argument that Blacksburg shouldn't be the only place that had uh, commemorated its um, being on the Continental Divide. And I think there's some interest. Uh, I got, got a call from the mayor of Christiansburg who said, well, maybe we're going to put up some signs. So we'll, we'll say we may get uh, Continental Divide signs put up in uh, Christiansburg. This is Main Street. This is back in Blacksburg. And uh, this is looking basically north and uh, west uh, towards downtown Blacksburg. We're about a mile away. Uh, Airport Road is, is uh, at the light in the distance. That's a turn to the left. And uh, downtown Blacksburg is about a mile away in the distance. And here we're crossing the in, in the Eastern Continental Divide. This is a better picture I showed you earlier, uh, a small view of this. This is from up near the uh, Blacksburg Golf Course right here on Graves Avenue and looking down. And if you look uh, carefully into the distance, you can see the uh, Virginia Tech campus in the, uh, in the distance. And on the left is the Virginia Tech Golf Course. Here on the, the bypass, this is heading towards Christiansburg. Uh, and uh, under South Main Street, the bridge goes, the South Main Street goes over the bridge, and this is on the 460 bypass. This is another crossing of the uh, Proclamation Divide in Blacksburg. And here near the hospital, the hospital is down to the, to the left. Uh, this is uh, we're actually Montgomery County, in between Blacksburg and Christiansburg, and uh, we're uh, crossing it. Uh, there's a the company of motels on the right. And we're heading towards Blacksburg, about five miles from downtown Blacksburg here. And the hospital is down left. And this is another crossing of the Eastern Continental Divide in Blacksburg. So having seen in general what's going on with the Continental Divide and relating it specifically to uh, my local geography, Blacksburg and Christiansburg, I want to talk about how the proclamation line is, uh, I, I consider it to be a, a provocation for the revolution. A couple of quotes. This is Archibald Henderson writing in 1930 who says, By the southern colonies, and especially by Virginia, were their arrogant but hazy charter claims to vast western territory, the proclamation was regarded as a tyrannical curtailment of their liberties for the benefit of the fur trade. In other words, Henderson is saying that the fur traders had the west, they had the Ohio country, and the Virginians were not going to be allowed to settle it so that the fur trade could continue. And Henderson goes on to say, in Virginia, the speculators and the land plungers, I like that phrase, the land plungers, were, dock, were balked in their grandiose schemes. The great land companies foresaw the collapse of their colossal projects, and even the officers and the soldiers themselves, the officers and soldiers mentioned in the proclamation, felt deprived of the opportunity to exploit the West through lands to be grinded for them for their military service. So Virginia had arrogant and hazy charter claims, but they were upset, the speculators and land plungers were upset when they couldn't carry forth their, their grandiose schemes to uh, claim the West. Here's Isaac Samuel Harrison writing in 1926, by 1774, Virginia's claim to these rich lands was threatened by the extreme likelihood 
that the royal government would grant the Ohio and Kentucky Company, not a Virginia Company, would be granted the um, rich lands in Ohio but, or to the Walpole Company of Philadelphia. And there was, Harold says, great apprehension in Virginia lest the Philadelphia Company should secure a charter from the Crown and Virginia lose her claims based on the Charter of 1609 and the Indian Treatise. So that the 1763 proclamation line becomes a major, major event in Virginia in terms of forcing the Virginians to consider that they're going to lose what they consider their natural right at their western land. Now, to give you some examples of what's going on, I'll talk briefly about the Fincastle surveys. This is the Smithfield Plantation in Blacksburg, founded in 1772 by William Preston. And from here, from this, from this very building, it's been much restored, but from this very place, uh, the newly appointed Fincastle County Surveyor, William Preston, sent out parties of deputy, sen deputy surveyors as far west as Louisville, Kentucky. And generally, uh, when the history of Kentucky is written, the history of Kentucky is written with the so-called Fincastle surveys being the first event, significant event, of Kentucky history. And these land surveys were made by, for many men, these land surveys west of the proclamation line were made by many men who would become leaders in the American Revolution. And so a party went forward from here, and we fortunately have the, uh, have the records of that party, led by John Floyd, John Floyd the surveyor, uh, father of the, the future John Floyd, the governor of Virginia, who obviously was born in Kentucky. And this, is, this comes from uh, Lewis Preston Summers' uh, book published in 1903. And what I've done is highlight here these surveys. This is land surveyed by Floyd and Hancock Taylor and, and others lying mostly in modern-day Kentucky and it's surveyed for reading down the red, the red highlighted William Christian, George Washington, Patrick Henry, William Preston, William Byrd, uh, Adam Stevens, uh, and again William Byrd. All of these men become prominent Virginians in the, in the revolution later. So this is land which is being served just before the opening, surveyed just before the opening of the revolutionary period. Here's the, the marker, uh, which is uh, out in um, West Virginia, uh, at the mouth of the Coal River, where the Coal River meets the Canal River for George Washington's Coal River Tract, surveyed by John Floyd in 1774 and patented, recorded in Williamsburg on April the 12th, 1774. And it, uh, was bounded by the coal rivers and altogether five miles and 88 poles it, uh, you know, along the river and it embraced the site of modern day St. Albans, West Virginia. It was originally granted to a man called Charles Min Thruston for service in the French and Indian War, but what happened was that these soldiers, uh, there was a whole business in contacting soldiers who had these land grants from the French and Indian War under the 1763 proclamation and then buying them and selling them. So they developed in the 1770s a, um, a big practice in purchasing soldiers' land grants. And George Washington, William Preston, and others were actively involved in that. <coughs> Interestingly, from, George, from William Preston, based in, in modern-day Blacksburg, at Smithfield, there are actually eight surviving letters from uh, that period, from 1774 February to 1775 April. And they're all about land located, as I've shown you, the picture at the confluence of the Coal and Canaveral Rivers. And Preston wrote from Smithfield, and Washington wrote from uh, Mount Vernon. And the lands, the letters describe Washington's desire to have uh, Preston survey and enter Western land for him, which was quite illegal under the, the proclamation of 1763. But it certainly, the correspondence exemplifies the passion of one member of the Virginia elite, uh, Washington, to acquire uh, Western land. I've published a all of these letters are published in a Smithfield Review article, which I have um, written. Now, in terms of the overall history of this situation, uh, I'm very fond of the opinion of the American historian who's taught for many years in Canada, Mark Engel. Mark Engel wrote a, wrote a book um, which was published originally in uh, 1988 and was, was subsequently um, uh, reprinted, uh, called A Mighty Empire, speaking of the origins of the American Revolution. So the arguments I make using this slide derive strictly from Egnall. 
he noted that as early as 1767, Washington, who was very familiar with West, Washington, done a lot of surveying in the West, wrote as early as 1767 that the proclamation line must fall, of course, in a few years. And Agnew concluded that it was the denial of the access to Western land by the proclamation that was particularly provocative to the northern, to the planters of Virginia's northern neck, the so-called northern neckers. That's the land which lies between the Potomac River to the north and the Rappahannock River to the south. And that was the such leaders, uh, Agnew cites, quote, the Washington, the Lees, and the Carters, and the Masons. So this is George Washington, Richard Henry Lee, uh, the Carter family, the whole Carter family, and King Carter, and uh, George Mason, were all part of this northern neck elite, all of whom, as I've showed you, had grants, successful grants, to western land, cut off by the proclamation. And so they were very interested in overthrowing the proclamation, and by revolution, if it was necessary to do that. This is a second opinion uh, from a fellow called uh, Woody, Woody Holton, who's a very prominent historian, works in South Carolina now, and he wrote a book uh, in 1999 called Forced Founders, Indians, Dead of Slaves, and the Making of the Amer American Revolution in Virginia. I'll quote in the next slide, here's what Woody Houghton said. Woody Houghton said that as late as uh, 1774, the Virginia speculators held hope that the proclamation might be repealed in London. However, in 1774, the British ab authorities abolished all Western land grants and even banned grants to American military veterans that had been specifically authorized under the 1763 proclamation. All hope of Western expansion was quashed. In consequence, says, quote, says Holden, I'm quoting him, the Virginia gentry led Virginia into the American Revolution. Now, of course, there are all kinds of events in Boston, and there's a whole New England aspect to the American Revolution. But in my opinion, we don't understand and we don't interpret sufficiently the Western Virginia connection to the American Revolution and the provocation that the 1763 line and this 1774 repeal, both that, that um, 1774 repeal of the, um, uh, of the Western land grants, what provocation that was, for the revolution. I have written that most leading Virginians were land speculators. They were angered by the action of the king in shutting off their commercial activities in the West. And historians consider the drawing of the proclamation line to have been a significant provocation in Virginia for the revolution that began just 13 years later. It's remarkable to think that it was just 13 years we went from the Annus Mirabilis, from the year of British miracles around the world from 1763, the acquisition of half a million acres of North America, and 13 years later, we have the proclamation, we have the Declaration of Independence. Hard to believe it just takes 13 years that this change took place. Classic example, how badly the British mismanaged North America. So, in conclusion, when you're driving in Blacksburg, the seemingly distant and long ago 1763 proclamation line is never far away. And that's also true in Christiansburg. In fact, it's true anywhere in Montgomery County. You're never very far from the 1763 proclamation line. In the conventional telling of Virginia history, it's the Tidewater story that dominates, the planters and the slave owners along the, the rivers that flow into the Chesapeake Bay. But in fact, in my view, Western Virginia is far more important for the story of Virginia than is Tidewater. And perhaps, just perhaps, a line drawn in Western Virginia that goes through today's Blacksburg and through today's Christiansburg was the most single provocation for the Virginians' revolution of 1776. So to end this, here's, you can uh, stop the tape and you can read this. Here's the Blacksburg Main Street sign that I showed you smaller earlier, which summarizes what I've said, I wrote this text in, in the year of the 250th anniversary. The Main Street near here, with that blue line, crosses a hardly perceptible ridge line, which divides the water which flows to the east, to the Atlantic, uh, from the uh, water flowing to the Gulf of Mississippi. And in October 1763, by royal proclamation, George III forbade Indians to settle west of this line, and they considered it taking up western land. The Virginians considered their natural right and shutting off the access to this land 
was a provocation that accelerated the building momentum in Virginia for the coming of the American Revolution. Thank you.